Therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart. But we have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word. But by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone, to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, oh, sorry, ladies, I've jumped. I'm at verse five now. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to death. For Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. I feel I should explain that my glasses are very focal, and one of the downsides of speaking on Zoom is that I can't quite get the distance right. So sometimes you're in focus and my Bible's not. And sometimes it's the other way around, <laughs> but bear with me. I think, I think I'll manage. If I was to ask you if you had had any special hopes for this year, I wonder how you would answer. Perhaps my hopes for um, a special time uh, with family or a special holiday that you had planned to have by yourself or with others. Maybe there was a new ministry that you had hoped to join or to become part of or to facilitate in your church or in your neighborhood. Or maybe you just hoped that you'd get more time with some particular family members. Maybe you hope that you'd be able to get closer to a son-in-law or a daughter-in-law or grandchildren who you thought you'd be able to see more of. When we don't get what we want, we can often wind up quite sad and confused and disappointed. And hope that is not fulfilled can leave us with questions and they can nag away at us and sometimes begin to play in our mind, settling our hearts and leaving us wondering what's actually going on. When hope is low, the safest and the most secure place to go is the Lord Jesus Christ and his word. God himself revealed to us, revealed to us in the Bible, in the words that he has especially designed and communicated to us, and also in the actual person of Jesus, in his word made flesh. And the Lord calls us over and over again 
over and over again, ladies, to come back to him and to come back to his word, to check his view of any given situation that we're in, because he knows how to settle our hearts. And there would have been women in Corinth who would have felt that their low, that their hope was running at a low ebb. The church in Corinth was a, it was a new church. And life for them was just as complicated as it is for us. In relationships, in politics, with money, with how people viewed women and what they could do, or whether or not they were valuable. There would have been illnesses and diseases, which in Corinthian times were unheard of and there was no treatment for them. Life could be unpredictable and hope could be difficult to come by, even in a city like Corinth which was wealthy and prosperous. Now, Corinth is in Greece, and it was in a little piece of land right between the north and the south. So it was on the north-south highway, effectively. And it was also at a really important geographical point for trade routes, for people that sailed from one part of the world to the other. Because in fact, a bit like the Cape of Good Hope in Africa, the very southern tip of Greece is a very dangerous place to sail around. It has a notorious reputation. And so people would not sail around it. They would come up the side, right to where Corinth was, and there was a port just on the edge there and another port just on the edge there in a little isthmus, a little tiny piece of land that joins two larger pieces. We have a lot of them in Scotland. They're called tarbits up here. And what they would do is they would take all the cargo off the boats, ferry it across, get back on another boat and go on your way to avoid taking that dangerous journey. If your boat was little enough, you'd put the boat on wheels and drag it across to the other side. It's actually how the Vikings invaded lots of Scotland and conquered it, but that's another story. Corinth was really, really important because the Roman colony that was right there benefited from being on this highway, North-South Highway, and also this route going across to save this dangerous sail. And when Julius Caesar rebuilt this colony, he actually built it with super wide roads and he built fountains and gardens. There were loads and loads of businesses in this city, the normal kinds of businesses that you would get where there are lots of people from all over the world. So there were lots of restaurants, there were hotels, there was even a place that people could go and debate and blue and white marble stones had been used to make it look very, very beautiful. There was also a huge, huge temple to the goddess Aphrodite, the goddess of love, ironically. And that temple had a thousand sacred priestesses who were effectively prostitutes. And every night they came down into the town from the temple and encouraged all kinds of immorality. It was a prosperous city and it was a city full of trouble and depravity and poverty and illness. It was a city which loved the arts and loved beauty, but a city where there was a lot of darkness. A little bit like if you put Las Vegas and London and New York all together. That was a bit what Corinth was like. And a church begins to grow 
a little church begins to grow in this city, not that long after the Lord Jesus has actually walked on this earth. Now, I'm telling you these things for a couple reasons, ladies. The first one is that when we look at the Bible, it is very important to look at what was happening at the time that the Bible was written. If you're actually going to study a passage of scripture, you need to know what it meant to the people at that time to be able to understand the layers of meaning that are in it. But the other reason I'm telling you is because it helps us keep perspective on how things are for us today. It is highly unlikely that you are facing things that are that different from what the women of Corinth were facing in their day. They might have different names today, but it's still the same kind of issue. But the God of the Bible, God of the Bible, spoke to Paul in such a way that he was inspired to write these very words to the believers in Corinth. And you know that when they were written, the God of the Bible knew that tonight we would look at this passage. And he knew that we would need these verses to speak into our lives tonight. So they were also written with us in mind. The church in Corinth had hardly any Jews in it. Hardly any. It had everything from well-to-do business people and very capable Greek women to thugs who had been converted off the streets of Corinth and refugees who were moving from one place to another or fleeing something. Very few of them knew the Old Testament. They weren't familiar with it. They had know it. They were men and women who were trying to work out what it meant to follow God in a city that was full of ideas and beliefs, philosophically and religiously, that were confusing. They were influenced by wanting to look good. That was a big deal in Corinth. People wanted to look good and they wanted to sound good. Sounds a bit like Facebook or Instagram. Yeah. They kept picking up on the wrong parts of what Paul was teaching. They kind of nitpicked and got confused. And they also had a tendency to say that they liked one particular kind of teaching or, or another. So you might be familiar with the fact that there was another man who also helped Paul in Corinth called Apollos. And some of the people in the church said they liked Apollos and some of them said they liked Paul. A bit like saying I like John Piper or I like Alistair Begg or some of the other people who are famous in the, in the conservative world today. They tried to make the church appeal to their culture. Sounds funny, doesn't it? But that is what they were trying to do. And they also struggled to understand whether or not sexual purity had any relevance at all in their culture. Things haven't changed very much since the first century AD, have they? It sounds very familiar to us. The Corinthians, they wanted Paul to help them and they needed Paul to help them to answer questions that they had. Should they be shopping for food in the markets that were attached to the temple of Aphrodite? Should they do that or shouldn't they? What about if somebody was married and then they became divorced? How did that work? What should they do? What about sexual relationships outside of marriage? How could someone stay pure in Corinth? What about capable 
women in the church who were maybe business women and could read and could write, shouldn't they be leading church services? Corinthians 1 and 2 are basically Paul dealing with the problems that were coming up in the church and the questions that they had about how to live as believers. And Paul doesn't ever mince his words, does he? He always goes straight to the point. And he's also trying to explain to them the authenticity of his ministry. In all of the answers that Paul gives, he roots himself in Jesus Christ and the teachings of Jesus Christ. So let's look again at the passage. The very first part of our passage says, therefore, therefore, having this ministry, by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart. What ministry? The very fact that he says, therefore, makes me think, therefore, what? And it forces us back into chapter three to answer that question. You might like to read chapter three later on this evening, ladies, or tomorrow, perhaps read chapter three and chapter four over the weekend, just to remind yourself of things that we've talked about and to really benefit from it. In summary, chapter three is talking about a new relationship of covenant with God. One where God doesn't just write things on stones, but he writes things on people's hearts. Things that Jesus Christ lived and died for. This ministry is what the people of Corinth had been told about when Paul was actually with them. He's not now, he's away and he's writing to them, but he had told them about this ministry when he was with them. The power that raised Jesus from the dead is the same power that steps into the life of everyone who accepts the reality that Jesus died and rose again. That he is the perfect son, sinless son of God and that he offers forgiveness in a new relationship of covenant for anyone at any time can come and exchange their shattered life for his righteousness. The Corinthians' faith confirmed what Paul was teaching, and it didn't depend on their suitability or Paul's cleverness. Chapter 3 says, we are not sufficient in our in our our sufficiency is for God. God's mercy is what makes his ministry possible. When you go to the petrol station to fill your car up with petrol, you plug in the pump and you click it, don't you, to get it going. And the petrol starts to come or the diesel starts to come. It's not coming from the pump. It's coming from the reservoir underneath the forecourt that you are standing on. And God's mercy is the reservoir underneath the pump that allows this ministry of grace to be pumped up and into our lives by his spirit. God's mercy had brought Paul to Corinth in the first place. God's mercy brought my mom into my life to tell me about the Lord Jesus. God's mercy brought someone into your life to tell you about Jesus. God's mercy gives us the ministry to tell other people about him. And we don't lose heart because his ministry does not depend on us and our capacity. It depends on him and his capacity. It's not your 
reservoir. And it's not your husband's reservoir. It's God's reservoir. And Paul wants to underline that he's not tampering with this message. He's not tampering with the truth. In verse 2 and 3, he says, by the open statement of the truth, he is commending himself. Paul has already taught this, this really young church, ladies, that God's authority is absolute. His love and his power is best displayed in his own dear son, Jesus. And Paul does not mess around with that. I find these words really encouraging and reassuring. When I think of what I've read and heard in the news just in the last two weeks, just in the last two weeks, words like underhanded and cunning and disgraceful, Paul is making sure that the Corinthians know they don't apply to him and how he's had God's word. God's view is that the truth will commend itself. The truth stands because it is true. So every truth is actually God's truth in the first instance. The confusion of the world and all that it chases after is where the blinding actually happens. And the God of this age, he's very clever, but he hasn't really changed his ta tactics. He's only changed his tools. He still uses power, money, looking good, feeling happy, me first. That's what he uses. And he spreads it like a veil or like a mist over people. And they can't see properly. They can't see through it. But the God of eternity is in contrast to the God of this age. He's the God of eternity. And he has a strong and a clear light. And he pours it out in the word of God and in the person of Jesus Christ. So when people reject the truth and the light, they're not rejecting us. They're rejecting the message and they are rejecting God himself. And it's why we proclaim not ourselves, but Jesus. If light is really going to shine properly, it has to come from God. And it will only ever show him in more detail. We are being offered in verse six. If you look at this verse again, it's a beautiful verse. We are being offered the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So when the troubled and tired women of the Corinthian church, perhaps running low on hope for their families, maybe a daughter, or maybe just the sheer strain of a hard marriage, maybe even for people in the church, both of whom knew the Lord Jesus, or sadness about life, about its disappointments, about its unfulfilled hopes, when they were losing heart, Paul wanted them to remember 
that the ministry of Christ is to lift the darkness. When it seems as though the gospel just isn't making enough difference in our daily lives, when we just can't see it. We need to look not at ourselves, but at Jesus. If they relied on any other light, it would be like putting on a veil. I don't know if some of you have ever been to weddings or other events where sometimes women wear very fancy hats and they have a bit of a veil. But it does actually, it does actually get in the way of you being able to see them properly. And if we let the things of this world get in the way, we won't see God properly. You know, it's interesting that in chapter 3, actually verse 18, if you take a look at that, it speaks of our unveiled faces. Verse 18 says, and we all with unveiled face, behold the glory of the Lord, the, Lord, the Lord and are being transformed into the same image from one glory to another. There's a contrast there between the veil that the God of this age casts and the unveiling that we experience. We see the glory of Jesus. It's saying that when we look at him, he actually changes us. Now, I know you've heard that before, but think about it. It means that when you stand and look at him, you look different. You look different to everybody else who's looking at you. So even when you think that the gospel is not having a difference, even on the days when you think, I don't understand why this isn't easier, <laughs> look at Jesus. He will change how you look. Verse 5 says, for what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your servants, for Jesus' sake. The church in Corinth were told, do not lose heart, do not tamper with the truth. Do not proclaim yourself. Proclaim Jesus. And you and I are told the same thing tonight. Don't lose heart, ladies. Don't tamper with the truth. Don't proclaim yourself. Proclaim Jesus, the same one, the same matchless Savior who generations of Christians have put their faith and their trust in. And I think there's a fourth don't. Don't be surprised when you make a hash of it. Don't be surprised when you fail. Because 2 Corinthians 4, 7 says, but we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. Don't be surprised when you constantly feel at the utter end of your resources. You're supposed to. The surpassing power is God's, not yours. 
he has the ability to execute every action he chose. That's power. Beyond anything else we have ever known, that's surpassing. And you don't. And neither do I. From God. The plainness of the jars of clay is very deliberate. They're supposed to be plain. They're supposed to show up the sheer beauty of the treasure within. It's an honor for us to do that. To show the magnificence of what God is like. That's a wonderful thing that we're able to do because of our weakness and our plainness. Our limitations are a beautiful backdrop for him to show his power. And that was the whole point. And it was the whole point why Paul wrote those words to those Christians in Corinth. And it's why he writes them for us to read tonight. Even when, even when everything seems lost, ladies, these next verses cover pretty much everything. If we look at verses 8 to 12, I'll just read them out again. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. Paul writes about being afflicted in every way. Perhaps you have a very good understanding of what that means and how it feels. Maybe it's a persecution or a problem that's very hard to talk about. Maybe it's something that has been going on for as long as you can remember. And perhaps some of it is very personal. Maybe it's happening in the church in which you're actually trying to serve or work. Life brings a lot of perplexing circumstances for those that we love and for ourselves. Perhaps sorrow and disappointment leave you, especially this year, just feeling worn out and worn down. I had the privilege a couple of months ago of listening to a series of podcasts that I would highly recommend. They're based in the States, but there's a lot of good stuff that comes out of the States. Not in the last couple of weeks, though. <laughs> anyway, that's another story. <laughs> Let's hope things are going to settle down there and improve. Uh, the podcasts were about a new book which has been written about Elizabeth Elliot. She died a couple of years ago, and her daughter and her closest friend have given uh, a well-known Christian author called Ellen Vaughn her personal journals and her letters to family to add to a new biography about her. And the really interesting thing about this is that, of course, it means that um, the platform that people might, or pedestal, shall I say, that people might have put Elizabeth Elliot on, 
is one that uh, gets knocked away because we're able to see a woman who um, worked hard to live a life of faith in the midst of ongoing hardship. It's not just that she lost her husband at the beginning. She had repeated episodes of times in her life when things did not go the way that she had hoped. And one of them, within just a few years of Jim Elliott's death, was when she had gone back to the very tribe who had killed him and the other men with him. She went back to work with that tribe. Now, that's a fairly well-known story. She went back with her very young daughter and lived amongst them. But what people don't know till now is that she was only able to be there for a limited amount of time, and then she had to leave and go back to the States because there was another single missionary, a woman who was also working there. And their relationship became so difficult, fractious, and discouraging that she decided that she needed to go back to the States in order for it not to totally fall apart. And she writes this, I'm just gonna read you. Um, she wrote in a letter to her mother, these words, I'm just gonna read them to you. I find that faith is more vigorously exercised when I can find no satisfying explanation for the way God does things. I have to hope without evidence seen that things will come right in the end. Not merely that we shall receive compensation, but that we and all creation shall be redeemed. This means infinitely more than that good will eventually outweigh evil. She understood that what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus. And she had to prove it over and over and over and over again in her life when people did not know that's what she was doing. Paul obviously had every reason to write these words to the Corinthians. They needed to hear them. And of course, we know that the words were written by Paul at God's urging. They're his words. And so they are for us too. An incessant experience of hardship does not mean you have been abandoned by God. He wants us to find our deepest safety in him. The contrast between the jars of clay and the surpassing power is matched by the contrast between the hardship of something that feels like it's killing us and the opportunity to let the powerful life of Jesus become our beating heart. We're told in verse 10, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. Life is certainly painful. That's the death part. And there's only one place of safety and rest, Jesus. That's life. I don't know what hopes you had for this year. I'm sure you all had them. I don't know what you hoped for that hasn't actually come about or happened and isn't going to this year. I do know that the ministry 
in which you are involved, and in some cases in which your husbands are involved, is not your own. The ministry that we have is rooted, it's rooted in a cross. And in a man who in the perfection of deity gave his life to save people who desperately need him. People like the women in Corinth, who I look forward to meeting one day in heaven. And people like you and me, people who are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, struck down, but not destroyed. We need to be centered in Jesus. We need everything that we do to be centered in Jesus. There's no part of your life that doesn't need him. The enter of it because you're not enough, ladies. You're not enough for your husbands or your children or your churches. You're not enough. You're not supposed to be. They need Jesus. They need you to minister Jesus to them. Do not try and minister yourself. What we all need is the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And he has such a beautiful face to gaze at, to be enraptured by, to know his love in. We do not lose heart. We do not tamper with the truth. We let his surpassing power radiate out the in our lives. Because like the Corinthians, we do not proclaim ourselves. We proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord.